So I very, was very privileged to be visiting Professor uh, today. Um, you must be very proud of your residents. They were stellar um, in clarity of thought, in background knowledge, in poise, confidence. Uh, it was really great to have them um, in, in the room. But they're not done yet, so I have other <laughs> cases for you tomorrow. So I'll discuss uh, a topic that's dear to me, uh, magnetic resonance elastography. And I must acknowledge the support from uh, different uh, funding agencies and foundations. And also uh, my former mentor at the uh, University of California, San Diego, uh, Dr. Claude Serlin, uh, who contributed to the uh, discussions um, and to some of the images that uh, are part of this presentation. Now I know it's a little presumptuous to cite oneself, but we put a lot of work uh, into this review article, uh, the four of us, um, Claude and I, and also two engineers and physicists, uh, Guy Cloutier, who's a uh, specialist in ultrasound elastography, and Nick Zaverny, who's an MR physicist. And so we proposed a, a review article on ultrasound and MR elastography, was accepted by uh, the AGR uh, editor, and this was split in two manuscripts. So the first one was on principles and techniques, Second one was on diagnostic perfumes, confounders, and future directions. So I'll present parts of the material in this article plus uh, new material. If you're like me and you learn better at your own pace uh, by reading articles, then I would advise you to take a, a look at, at this paper. So the purpose of this educational exhibit is to review the basic principles of MR elastography, to which I will refer to as MRE from now on. I'll provide a pictorial review of cases of chronic diffuse liver disease and some focal lesions. And also briefly touch uh, indications in other organs as well. So this is an exciting field that was invented 20 years ago at Mayo Clinic by uh, Richard Eman's team, um, the current chairman uh, of radiology at Mayo Clinic. And it was only fairly recently introduced in the clinical field uh, for liver fibrosis uh, staging in 2007. Conceptually, it can be seen as a form of virtual palpation, so a way of assessing mechanical properties of tissues using waves and measuring wave propagation speed. Currently, in the abdomen, the main clinical ab application is staging of um, liver fibrosis in chronic liver disease. As the spatial resolution improves, um, there are also emerging indications in other organs as well. So this is a screen capture from the seminal paper that was published in Science in 1995. Uh, the authors were very prescient uh, back then. This is an, a color image from the Science paper that shows on the left an agar phantom with two inclusions of gelatin at different concentrations. There's a soft inclusion and a stiffer inclusion. You can see that the wavelength that is generated at the surface of the phantom is fairly constant and then either elongates or shortens, depending on uh, the stiffness of the inclusions. On the bottom row, you can see an elastogram or stiffness map that corresponds to the top image. And the color coding represents relative stiffness. On the right is the anatomical proof of concept. This was a liver that was explanted and put it into an agar phantom. You can clearly see the cortex in the agar gel. My presentation will be in three parts. In the first section, I will discuss the principles and techniques, including a general taxonomy of elastography techniques, a compa brief comparison between them, types of mechanical waves that travel inside uh, tissues, wave generation, key concepts of elastography, I must discuss mechanical properties in units, and the components of MRE. So this is the big picture of elastography as it stands today. On the left, you have static or quasi-static techniques, which refer to techniques that we cry, require manual compression to evaluate stiffness. The underlying rationale being that soft tissue tends to deform, whereas stiff inclusions tend to resist deformation. So this is typically used in ultrasound. On the right, you have dynamic, also known as shear wave imaging, which requires production of shear waves and measurement of shear wave speed inside tissues. This can be further subdivided into transient if the excitation is very short in the range of milliseconds, 
or continuous if mechanical vibrations are applied throughout the uh, MR sequence, for example. So the commercially available ultrasound techniques fall into the dynamic transient elastography methods, whereas currently commercially available MR techniques fall into the dynamic continuous elastography techniques. So I'm providing here uh, a few schematics that illustrate uh, how these techniques work. You may have heard of 1D transient elastography, which is commercialized as FibroScan by EchoSense. So this is used as a point of care uh, instrument by hepatologists and internists to assess liver fibrosis. This machine is essentially a 1D, like a piezoelectric crystal that is mounted on a vibrating piston and placed against the skin at an intercostal uh, location. Shear waves are propagated um, in the liver tissue and are illustrated here in blue and they are tracked with ultrasound beams at very high uh, speed. So depending on the shear wave speed, we can assess liver stiffness. Now this technique doesn't produce anatomical image like we're used to in ultrasound. So there's no B-mode uh, image. There are M-mode, A-mode images, and based on the slope, we can estimate uh, the liver stiffness. Typically, users will perform 10 measurements and the system reports the median and the interquartile range to assess whether measurements are valid or not. More recently, elastography techniques have been implemented into clinical ultrasound systems. So these are known as point shear wave elastography, uh, also commercialized as acoustic radiation force impulse. You may have heard of ARF, the RF acronym by one vendor. So the idea is that we focalize ultrasound beam in an area and like a a pebble dropped in a pond, it generates waves traveling sideways. We measure the speed of these waves, which tend to travel slowly in soft tissue and more rapidly in stiff or uh, cirrhotic <coughs> tissue. An advantage of this method is that we can use B-mode imaging to place a region of interest away from vessels and the capsule. A more recent variant is known as shear wave elastography. Instead of using one RV location, it focalizes the pulse at different areas and it generates a planar wave which illuminates the field. So one advantage is that we have a wide region of interest and we can draw different uh, ROIs inside. So all these techniques sample relatively small areas. Then comes MR elastography which is built on clinical MR systems. It relies on a transducer which has a plastic membrane applied against the patient's liver. Compression waves are produced and converted into shear waves inside the tissue. And then with special sequences and software, we can obtain wave images that are converted into elastograms. The units are represented in kilopascals from zero to eight, typically, where zero indicates very soft tissue and eight is high stiffness uh, found in cirrhotic uh, liver. The color scale is also very helpful as the uh, cool hues, blues and purples indicate soft tissue and the warm hues, yellow, orange and red, indicate stiff tissue. So this is a summary table drawn uh, from the, the article. It's a little crowded, but I'll only bring your attention to the bottom row. Currently, MRE is offered um, by the three major MR vendors relies on mechanical excitations at a fixed frequency of 60 hertz. In the research domain, we may use a wider range uh, of frequencies, as, you, as we will discuss later. And the units are reported in kilopascals. There are strains and, and limitations to each of these techniques. For MRI, the advantages are that hardware and software has been harmonized between different vendors it provides high diagnostic accuracy according to recent meta-analyses. It's robust in, even in patients with large body habitus or even ascites. Some current limitations are that um, the reliance on gradient echo sequences uh, limits these, um, the acquisition of images in patients with iron deposition, okay, because it shortens T2 star, as we've seen this morning. Um, there is 
some requirements in terms of post-processing. There's some subjectivity in the way we place the regions of interest. Okay, now let's switch gears and let's discuss waves. Unlike light, mechanical waves travel inside a uh, medium and involve particle motion. So there are four types of mechanical waves, two of which travel inside tissues. They're known as, or, or, or rocks, or solid material. They're known as body waves. In medical imaging, we use either compression waves or shear waves. So for compression waves, notice that the particle motion occurs, travels in the same direction as the wave itself. So let's imagine the following thought experiment. Let's say I'm holding a slinky toy, the extremity of a toy, you're holding the other extremity, and I'm tapping on it. You can imagine the rings that jiggle and travel to you, they may even bounce back. So these compression waves travel rapidly. Instead of this little tap motion, imagine that I'm doing a shear motion or a sideways motion. There will be, still be a snake-like motion that will travel slower than reach you. Those are shear waves. So I haven't invented this. This is a metaphor used uh, to teach seismology to kids. So it works quite well <laughs> because it provides a, a good mental and lasting mental image. Love and rarely waves uh, are sometimes seen in earthquake or at the surface of water and currently they don't have any medical uh, application. So in the early days of MRE, we generated, well, the inventors generated these shear waves um, by applying friction at their surface of phantoms. And these shear waves propagated inside uh, phantoms or inside tissue. The way to imagine these shear waves is by looking at them sideways. So I made this little animation, and you can see that the peaks of the waves are represented in red and the troughs in blue. And the degree of color saturation indicates the amplitude of the wave. And the black color indicates um, a, a null amplitude or absence of motion. So we remember from our high school and college years that waves can be divided, then can be described by uh, at least two properties, the amplitude, A, and the wavelength, lambda. The key concept of elastography, regardless of the, the modality, ultrasound or, or MR, is that you acquire baseline imaging, you apply waves at a known frequency, you measure this wave uh, in terms of amplitude and uh, wavelength, and knowing the wavelength and the frequency, you can compute the wave speed. C. Visually speaking, I'm illustrating three different scenarios. So on the left, you have soft tissue uh, that in which shear waves travel slowly. You can see the short wavelength. Let's say you have stiffer fibrotic tissue. The waves will travel more rapidly. Let's say you have very viscose tissue that dampens the, the waves. Then there's another property that occurs. It's called viscosity. And um, this is manifested by wave attenuation. This typically occurs in normal tissue and sometimes in fatty uh, liver as well. Currently, clinical MRE systems measure stiffness or elasticity. In the research domain, uh, physicists and biomechanical uh, engineers are interested in, in elasticity and viscosity as well. So in summary, the elastography techniques do not measure stiffness directly. Instead, they measure the shear wave speed, which is slow in soft tissue and faster in stiff tissue. Now, to make things more complicated, uh, this is converted into other uh, parameters that are derived from uh, engineering science and earth sciences. The one reported in MR elastography is known as magnitude of the complex shear modulus. Now, this is a mouthful to pronounce. So it's shortened papers uh, in the general uh, lay language as shear stiffness or simply stiffness. Some ultrasound elastography techniques like FibroScan um, also report the elastic or Young modulus. Okay? Also in kilopascals, but with a different scale. So this is bad news, but also good news for us. So the bad news is that different elastography techniques and manufacturers report results in different units and with different parameters.
But the good news is that there is fairly simple mathematical conversion rules from one to the other. So we can estimate what is the equivalent value. So for example, shear wave speed um, is reported in meters per second. The cross winding stiffness um, by MRE would be, let's say, 4 kilopascals. And the elastic Young modulus in the same patient might be 12 kilopascal. So we must be very uh, astute when it comes to the, uh, to the scale and units. So here are some images. On the top row, you have a patient with a normal uh, soft liver. And I've manually measured the uh, wavelength between two red uh, peaks. At the same scale, in a cirrhotic patient, you can see that the wavelength is very elongated. Now, based on assumptions on tissue density, uh, measurement of wavelength, known frequency, we can calculate the shear stiffness. Also notice on the right, you have an elastogram of a normal soft liver, and on the bottom, a stiff cirrhotic liver. Now, stiffness is a term that is permanently embedded in the uh, lay and scientific literature. It refers to the tactile sensation of, of touch, okay? Low stiffness, high stiffness. And I just want to provide a, a sneak preview of what's, what's coming ahead, uh, what's discussed in, let's say, international tissue elasticity conferences or at the ICMRM, so uh, conferences for, for nerds. <laughs> stiffness can be subdivided into spring-like properties, or dash pot or viscose properties. So spring properties or elasticity refers to a material that regains its original shape after being deformed. Okay, sp think of a spring. Dash pot is a characteristic, char characteristic of a material that resists movement or dissipates energy or resists flow. So think about oil or honey, which, which are viscose, whereas water has low viscosity and flows naturally. Now this is important because human tissues display mixtures of both. They have solid properties, there's collagen, um, but there's also fluid content, blood, um, interstitial fluid, uh, intracellular fluid. So engineers use different mathematical models to represent these um, simultaneous properties. They may represent dash pots and springs in series, in parallel, uh, or in infinite ladders of the two uh, systems. So there are different mathematical representations. So in the next few years, don't be surprised if you hear about elasticity, viscosity, uh, and uh, loss modulus. OK, now back to practical um, applications. There are five components to an MRE system. You need an MR scanner clinical MR at 1.5 or 3 Tesla uh, is perfect. You need a source of mechanical vibration, like the mechanical driver system illustrated above. You need a special MR sequence to acquire raw images that are converted with some mathematical filters into wave images and elastograms. So right now at our institution, we're running um, the uh, MR elastography hardware on a 1.5 and a 3T scanner, one for clinical and the other for uh, research. A nice aspect of uh, mechanical properties is that they are not dependent on magnetic field. So the stiffness that you measure at 1.5T in a patient will be the same that you would obtain at 3T. This is an illustration of the hardware. You need a source of mechanical vibration. So the blue and white box is a loudspeaker. It generates sound waves that travel through the plastic tube um, from the equipment room to the scan room. The discus is placed against the patient's liver, held in place with an elastic band, and then the patient is imaged with a phased array torso coil. This is a pulse sequence diagram. It's a partition that tells the uh, MR scanner how to perform the magic. So at the top, you have a sinusoidal wave, which represents the sound waves that you apply. We give it a little, uh, an advanced start to travel the eight meters uh, of the plastic tube. And this is then synchronized with a motion encoding gradient, or MEG, at the bottom. 
Notice that they're matched in frequency. And the underlying concept is that this is a phase encoding sequence where we apply phase encode information in one direction and then we rewind it. Okay, so you see that there's a bipolar gradient at the bottom with two lobes of opposite polarity but same amplitude. So in simple terms, what happens is that static particles that don't move are assigned some phase encode information and they are rewound. So they have no phase accretion. Whereas moving particles will have some phase encoding, but it's not completely rewound. So based on this, we know that a particle has moved over time. This is applied in the minus x plus x, minus y plus y, min minus z plus z direction. So at the end, you have a net vector of your displacement. So that's very, very clever. So the key learning points for the first section is that elastography is an emerging field that is built on existing clinical equipment, ultrasound and MR. Uh, it's an exciting revolution, and the theoretical resolution potential is in the range of microns. Okay, so it's very exciting what's coming ahead. Also, the tissue contrast mechanism is different from what we've seen previously. It's not T1, T2 diffusion, uh, arterial spin labeling, no, no, none of that. It's very mechanical properties in, in a very advanced way. MRE has been developed to measure stiffness, uh, both for clinical and research applications. Um, stiffness cannot be measured directly, so instead we measure shear wave propagation that is then converted into uh, stiffness. And the magic happens by tracking shear waves with phase contrast sequences that are also used in other applications in MR. Okay. In the second section, I will discuss image acquisition. So what are the steps involved in data processing? How do we interpret the images? What's the diagnostic performance? Some examples of diffuse liver disease and focal liver lesions with MRE. So on the left, you acquire raw images. You have the phase image and the magnitude image. This is converted um, using a filter to exclude compression waves and only retain the shear waves. There's um, an inversion algorithm that computes the stiffness from the wave images. The software also generates a confidence map that determines which are the areas of reliable or unreliable measurement. So the areas that are hatched out in the last image are excluded by the software. There's some interaction involved with the current um, version of the uh, commercially available software. The user should draw a region of interest that excludes the glycine's capsule because it's composed of collagen and would overestimate the stiffness. We also want to exclude the major blood vessels. At the end, we have an image of an entire slice and we can draw a region of interest uh, in the liver. These are examples of images acquired at the same level. On the left, you have a T2-weighted single-shot fast pinnacle sequence. On the right, an MR elastography wave image. So there's something soothing and metaphysical about these images, right? Um, something that I omitted to mention was that there are four phase shifts acquired, okay? So in addition to the vibrations and motion encoding gradients, we repeat the process by introducing little phase shifts to obtain four images. These are interpolated into eight images to provide a smooth video. Many phenomena occur at the same time. So these waves interact with each other, they bounce, they refract, and I've done a little schematic to illustrate what happens. We've seen this in high school and we're just revisiting it uh, in our adult life. So waves can be attenuated, they can be absorbed, they can bounce back at interface, they can be refracted if um, the uh, refraction properties at the two tissue, if the impedance, sorry, is different between two tissues. They can be converted from compression to shear waves. If a wave travels in a tiny slit, smaller than its wavelength, it can be diffracted and the combination of the above can cause scattering. Once images bounce back, they can add up. So this is known as constructive interference. They can also null out. This is called destructive interference. 
So there's a lot of the material. Um, there's a lot to learn, and lots of it is unscratched, unexplored territory. This is one of my favorite slides that shows in five different patients with biopsy-proven fibrosis stages, um, wave images, and corresponding elastograms. On the top row, you can see that normal tissue is attenuating, meaning that at the periphery, the waves are, have high amplitude, and they're dampened in the middle. You can see it, that it's dark. Okay? It's black in the middle. That is normal. From left to right, you can see that the wavelength is gradually increasing, and the wavelength is very long in cirrhotic liver. But also, the colors are very saturated, which means that a cirrhotic liver is very elastic but has low viscosity. It doesn't dampen these waves. On the bottom row, you can appreciate at a glance uh, a cirrhotic liver, and now you've become pros. You can spot diagnosis this from, from the hall. Right? So I'll show you another cases with variations on the same theme. Different elastography techniques have documented that stiffness increases exponentially with uh, increasing amounts of collagen and fibrosis. This has been documented with ultrasound elastography and MR elastography. This is a summary table of two meta-analyses on initially five and then 12 um, MRE studies for staging of liver fibrosis. In color, I have represented, I have highlighted the area under the rock curve. So these values um, indicate perfection if close to one and would be no better, better than a flip of a coin if the value was 0.50. So you want to be close to one. Actually, the fibrosis staging performance is excellent uh, according to these two meta-analyses. And if we compare ultrasound elastography with MR elastography, the staging accuracy is either equivalent or superior. Now, the little caveat is that these techniques are performed in different patients, so there's a need for direct head-to-head com -head comparison in the same patients with the two techniques. Now, let's review some examples. These cases are um, biopsy-proven uh, pathologies. So we have a 62-year-old woman with uh, hepatitis C and no fibrosis at liver biopsy. On the top images, you can see that the liver has normal morphology. There's no uh, ascites or varices. On the bottom row, you see short wavelengths, attenuating normal liver, and the elastogram shows um, a, a soft liver. And the measurement revealed a stiffness of 2.11 kilopascals. Here's a case of a 57-year-old lady with hep C cirrhosis. The liver is slightly bumpy, especially the left lobe, but it's not immediately apparent that there is um, overwhelming cirrhosis. However, the elastograms and wave images show an abnormal liver, and there's also increased spleen stiffness, which suggests that there may be underlying uh, portal hypertension. The stiffness was 6.23 kilopascals, which indicated presence of fibrosis uh, equal or larger than F3. And the rule of thumb uh, in hepatology is that above F2 would be an indication for, for treatment. Now, increased stiffness is not specific to fibrosis. Other conditions can cause this as well. For example, inflammation. So this is an example of a 65-year-old lady with biopsy-proven non-alcoholic steatohepatitis or NASH, who had inflammation and stage one fibrosis. We can see uh, on the stiffness map that um, it's slightly elevated at 3.88 kilopascals. And uh, the fat fraction map also shows that there's a moderate amount of fat deposition. So we can address these biomarkers of liver disease separately. This is an example of uh, successful MRE in a patient with ascites. So you can see the rim of liquid around the liver. Despite this liquid, compression waves can travel inside the liver and be converted into shear waves. This is relevant because FibroScan um, 
the presence of ascites is um, a cause of technical failure for fibroscan, which generates the shear waves at the surface of tissue and cannot propagate inside liquid because there's no lattice or no solid structure to support propagation of these shear waves. Also notice that there's another red bright spot at the surface, which corresponds to the costochondral cartilage. Okay, so this is a great sanity check. The technique measures what it intends to do, and it detects that there's a stiff structure near the skin. Moving further, MRE has been proposed as a technique for uh, assessing portal hypertension and predicting the presence of esophageal varices. So it also has prognostic value um, by assessing liver stiffness. We can see that in this case, this, the spleen is perhaps even stiffer uh, than the liver due to portal hypertension. Another emerging topic is the use of MRE for characterizing focal lesions. So I'll briefly cite the two seminal papers in this field. The first one was published by Venkatesh, based at Mayo Clinic, um, published in the AGR in 2008 on a variety of malignant and benign lesions. Another paper published by uh, Gartheiser and colleagues at Beaujon Hospital in Paris uh, assessed advanced parameters, so complex shear modulus, storage, and loss modulus in both benign and malignant tumors. Instead of looking at these numbers, I'll show you the graphs, which were, are easier to interpret. So this is the original paper from Venkatesh, which revealed that normal liver is soft on the left, and benign tumors such as hemangioma, hepatic adenomas, and FNH tend to be soft below 5 kilopascals, whereas malignant tumors such as metastases, HCCs, and cholangiocarcinomas tend to be stiffer. Um, even in comparison with fibrotic liver. Now, in practice, there's a lot more overlap. Okay, it's not as clear-cut as uh, um, announced in this paper, but still, there are very nice insights. For example, client Joe carcinoma is, is known by surgeons to be a stiff tumor. It causes capsular retraction, and at pathology, it's very fibrotic. It has a desmoplastic reaction. So the findings uh, in MRE fit uh, the physical intuition that we have of cholangiocarcinoma. Mm -hmm. And also because of the prognostic importance uh, and the poor outcome of these patients, it may be important in the future to differentiate cholangiocarcinoma and HCC, especially in liver transplant candidates. So let me show you a few examples. There are some challenges um, in detection of tumors with MRE. So in T2-weighted images, you can see on the top a colorectal cancer metastasis, on the bottom an HCC in a cirrhotic patient. So at a glance, you can appreciate intuitively the challenge that we're facing. It's easy to detect a stiff tumor in a soft liver, right? Because there's a stiffness contrast between the two. But what about a stiff tumor in a cirrhotic liver? Not so easy, right? So uh, it's overwhelmed by the surrounding uh, liver stiffness. So the technique may be good for characterization of tumors that are markedly stiffer than the background or the opposite. And it may be good for tumors that are larger than a certain size. Currently, my, my rule of thumb would be at least three centimeters. Um, I no longer consider characterizing these, these small lesions with current MRE sequences. So here are a few examples. Um, this is a benign lesion, a focal nodular hyperplasia. Uh, this, I believe, is, yes, a primovist sequence uh, in delayed phase. And there was uh, iso intensity of the tumor relative to the background liver uh, in the hepatobiliary phase. Despite being benign, it's slightly stiffer than the background liver. It can still be detected. This is a large uh, FNH that has a central scar, lobulated contours, has lobulated contours, scar, uptake of um, primovist in hepatobiliary phase. And it was biopsy proven FNH, uh, biopsy because of capsular retraction and concern for cholangial carcinoma. We can see that this tumor is markedly stiffer than the background liver, 
especially the, the central scar, which is even stiffer than the periphery of, of the lesion. This is an example of fat-containing adenoma, slightly hyperintense in T2, signal drop in out-of-phase imaging, which confirms the presence of fat, which would suggest the HNF1-alpha subtype, uh, enhances in arterial phase with some washout. The lesion is barely detectable from background liver. There's a lot of noise, okay? But these are the early days. Let's give it a few years. It will just get better. Hemangiomas. These lesions are, are puzzling to me because they're a network of capillaries um, and they behave like sponges that uptake contrast. They're mainly fluid, composed of fluid, and in theory, they shouldn't propagate the shear waves. And yet, we obtain higher stiffness values in some of these lesions. So there are still uh, some uh, underlying concepts that I, I must further explore. Same thing for sclerosing hemangioma. So uh, these lesions can be quite stiff, especially the uh, fibrosed portion at the center. This is an example of hepatocellular carcinoma, very nice example of a stiff tumor uh, that is even stiffer than the background of fibrotic liver. So um, there's a, a stiffness difference between the two that allow us to detect the tumor. Infiltrative carcinoma, I like to show this case because the left lobe is spared. You can see that on the T2-weighted fat sat sequence, there's an infiltrative tumor that is hyperintense. There is even portal vein thrombus. This is very stiff um, on the uh, MRE images, whereas the segment three is completely spared by tumor and has a softer, uh, softer consistence, consistency. <coughs> These are examples of metastases uh, in segment four associated with tumor in vein. Um, colorectal cancer metastasis is also stiff. This is a huge um, hepatic cyst adenoma that has some elevated uh, stiffness. And we can also see that it's very attenuating, suggesting uh, viscose properties, of liquid inside. So the take home messages for the second section are that the main current in clinical indication is assessment of liver fibrosis. Advantages of MRE are that uh, it samples a larger portion of the liver than ultrasound elastography techniques. It offers excellent diagnostic accuracy. Um, and there are also emerging indications, such as detection of inflammation, characterization of focal lesions, and assessment of portal hypertension. As a rule of thumb, malignant tumors tend to be stiffer than benign tumors, especially HCC and cholangiocarcinoma. Now in the final minutes, I will briefly discuss um, the biological and technical confounders that affect uh, accuracy. I'll discuss also future directions um, in research and eventually in the clinical domain, such as multi-frequency MRE uh, and future directions with a brief overview of um, what is being performed in other organs than the liver. So this is a pitfall. Um, in this patient, who had hemochromatosis and a biopsy-proven cholangiocarcinoma. There was marked signal drop uh, in, at longer TE sequences due to the presence of iron. And this is, decreases the signal-to-noise ratio of gradient recall echo sequences. So hence, the very noisy images at the bottom that could not produce good estimates of stiffness. Also, the small tumor uh, was drowned by the surrounding uh, low SNR. So it's barely detectable, despite being a cholangiocarcinoma. Some cases can be extreme, for example, severe iron deposition um, can be in uninterpretable. Okay, so right now, the reliance on gradient recall echo sequence uh, does not permit quantification um, in uh, moderate to uh, high iron overload. But there are technical solutions to this, such as using spinnacle sequences, which are in development, and use, uh, using uh, lower field strength in dedicated MRE apparatus. Another pitfall is wave attenuation in a patient who had um, 
hepatic flexure interposition of colon in front of the liver. So we can see that all areas of the right lobe are hatched out, whereas the left lobe was spared by the confidence uh, algorithm. There's a major um, biological pitfall, which is postprandial versus fasting state. So after a meal, there's increased return of splanchnic blood flow toward the portal vein, and this also elevates the hydrostatic pressure. It can overestimate the liver stiffness. So for example, before and after a meal in the same patient, the stiffness went from 2.0 kilopascals to 3.1 kilopascal. So there's a risk of false positive diagnosis of fibrosis. These are beautiful images from uh, Dr. Brown's team in Germany. Uh, he's one of the pioneers of advanced liver MR uh, at uh, Berlin Charité. So these are images acquired at different frequencies from 25 to 62 uh, hertz. And you can see that the wavelength in the same patient in the same session varies depending on the frequency. With these types of me multi-frequency measurements, we can assess elasticity and viscosity separately. These are exciting results from uh, one of our postdocs, Siavash Kazemirad. Um, these were acquired in an animal model of uh, NASH. So um, these, uh, these rats were fed a methionine-choline deficient diet that induced steatosis and inflammation. And on the explanted livers, we measured the stiffness, not with ultrasound or MRE, but with a rheological uh, instrument to measure mechanical properties ex vivo. And you can see that the measured stiffness varies from 0 to 900 hertz. So we're covering the entire frequency range that may be used in medical applications. Measured stiffness is lower at low frequency and higher at high frequency. So this explains in part why the measurements obtained by MRE acquired at 60 hertz cannot be directly compared with those of ultrasound elastography, typically in the range of 200 to 400 hertz. Okay. Now, just before uh, our dinner, I'll provide just a little other snippet that may be interesting. Mechanical engineers, to assess the properties of tissues across a frequency range, can also perform another type of, uh, of uh, assessment. They can maintain the frequency and do a temperature sweep. So intuitively, we know that when we cook uh, meat, the properties will change over time depending on the temperature, right? It may be very stiff when it comes out of the freezer, it will soften, and once you cook it, very well done, it will become stiff again. So this varies according to temperature. And there's an inverse relationship between temperature and frequency, okay? So low temperature is in this range, and high temperature is in that range. So if you want to think uh, in terms of intuitively, Think about heating your organ uh, on a pan fryer, and you'll have an idea of what's, what's happening at the other end. Okay? So that's for your own um, culinary intuition. Performing multi-frequency MRE is time consuming because you have to repeat the whole process several times. But there are techniques to add up these uh, frequencies in a multiband acquisition, and then perform a Fourier transform to assess the different individual frequencies. Decomposing elasticity and viscosity may be one way to assess inflammation and distinguish it from fibrosis. Now this is a sneak peek of other applications in other body parts. For characterization of meningiomas, um, MRE can differentiate stiff meningiomas that are difficult to resect for surgeons and represent a higher surgical risk from soft meningiomas that can be aspirated. MRE of the brain um, has been used for assessment of Alzheimer's disease. In these preliminary results, uh, stiffness was lower in patients with Alzheimer's disease, significantly stiffer in patients who were normal controls but had beta amyloid deposition and was 
even stiffer in normal controls without beta amyloid deposition. Take home message, brain softens with dementia over time. MRE has also been proposed in other organs, for example, in breast imaging for detection and characterization of lesions. Cancer tends to be stiff, more so than fibroadenoma, fibrocystic, and surrounding uh, breast tissue. The spleen um, is a predictor of portal hypertension and presence of uh, varices, and it correlates very well with gradient uh, pressure measurements. Proof of concept uh, papers have been published for detection of pancreatic, chronic pancreatitis and also adenocarcinomas, which are very stiff, and this is confirmed by our surgeons um, in vivo. MRE of the liver may detect interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy in kidney transplants. Um, may be used for assessment of fibroids and response to high food treatment. It's more challenging for assessment of skeletal muscles because in addition to mechanical properties, there's also the issue of isotropy because the um, stiffness properties change depending on the orientation of the fibers also changes at rest and at contraction, and depending on uh, the, the architecture of the muscles. So there's a lot of work to be done in, in that field. So this is my final summary. MRE is an exciting field because it is a new way to assess um, mechanical properties that is integrated to existing clinical MRI systems. It requires the synchronization of vibrations with motion encoding gradients, and it relies on clever software to uh, assess stiffness properties. Currently, it's uh, an emerging clinical tool for assessment of liver fibrosis. There are many um, investigational uses as well um, in the brain, lungs, heart, skeletal muscle, and other organs. So with this, this completes my presentation.